What's up guys and welcome to another episode of Captured Killers. Today I am going to be talking about the tragic death of Johnny Lewis and the fatal murder of Katherine Davis. So let's start with the comment of the last video that I did, which was about Candace Mosler. Oh my gosh, that was a crazy story. And this is from Kristen ASMR. <laughs> you are so good at telling these true crime stories. I am hooked, laugh out loud. I'm glad to see that you are posting more often. I love your lip gloss lipstick in this video. So what a sweet note from Kristen. I am going to be doing a video a week. So I'm going to be doing a true crime video every week. And I'm gonna shoot for Saturdays. So hopefully, fingers crossed, that goes well. I'm gonna try to get it up before Saturday because posting over the weekend just isn't a good day, but I'm gonna I'm gonna see what happens. Maybe I should shoot for Fridays. We'll see. And I'm so glad that, that these videos are going as well as they are. I have really, really thoroughly enjoyed doing them. I love the research, but it's when I get in front of the camera, I get so nervous. Thanks, Kristen, for your comment. I really appreciate it. Johnny Lewis was born on October 29th, 1983. Uh, Johnny was an American film star and actor, best known as playing the role of Kip Halfsack Epps on the show Sons of Anarchy. Sons of Anarchy was so good. I love that show. So when I heard about this case, I was 100% drawn to it and wanted to know more. So that's what really got me started on this case. Uh, the first episode of Sons of Anarchy aired on September 8th, 2008, and he was in the Sons of Anarchy for two seasons. Uh, Johnny grew up in the Los Angeles area, North Hollywood and Sherwin Oaks. Uh, he attended a performing arts school where he was set at the age five is when he debuted as a Hanukkah candle. He was the middle child of Michael and Devona Lewis. Johnny grew up in a Jewish oriented home, but his family was practicing Scientologists. His parents what was known within the religion at the highest available level, which is the operating threaten, threaten, or OT, the Roman numeral eight. According to the writings of Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard, refers to someone in a spiritual state who offers knowing and willing cause over life, thought, matter, energy, space, and time. Johnny's mother uh, was actively taking little Johnny to auditions starting at the age six, seven years old. He landed his first role in an escalator safety video featuring a rapping cartoon raccoon. He worked in commercials and was popular on shows like Malcolm in the Middle, Seventh Heaven, and Drake and Josh. At 18, money in his pocket, Lewis moved to Hollywood, where he would live with other actors, what is known as the entertainment industry as the Wilton Hilton. And I have some images of the Wilton Hilton. It kind of reminds me of like a frat house or, uh, you know, when you first go off to college, it just kind of reminds me of that. Inspiring actors, but studying in school, but studying acting. It looked like it was a lot of fun and right where you would be at the age 18. In 2005, Lewis began dating pop star Katy Perry. Being a son of a high-level Scientologist and Perry, the daughter of a Pentecostal Christian, were all public with their relationship. Opposites attract, I guess. Uh, the relationship lasted for just over a year. Perry allegedly wrote two songs, Teenage Dream album, The One That Got Away, and Circle the Drain. It was said that they were partially about Lewis. Whether that's true or not, I do not know, but I just found it interesting. The Circle the Drain one really, <laughs> it really got me going. I was really thinking about that, like, wow, that's foreshadowing on Katie's part? I have no idea. Like I said, they split after a year. Uh, Katie Perry wanted to focus on her career. That seems to be the politically correct way always for someone to break up. But, you know, 
her album did launch that following year, so maybe it was. In April 2009 was the first time Lewis moved in with Katherine Davis, who we'll talk more about later, um, in this bed and breakfast villa, also known as the Writer's Villa. His room was on the second floor. He seemed to adjust to the new home quickly. His friend, Bew Garrett, stated, I hung out with him over there a few times. I remember all the nice things that he had to say about Catherine and how she opened her place to artists and eccentrics. So it sounded like in 2009, the relationship was good and Johnny really liked living at the writer's villa. So let's get into who Catherine Davis is and her part in this story. Well, Katherine Davis owned the writer's villa, but she was an 81-year-old. Most people called her Miss Kathy. She was a small woman, only standing 5'3". She had moved to California in 1950 to attend UCLA and worked in various publishing jobs and eventually marrying James Davis. She had one daughter in 1958, Davis and her husband purchased the villa, later coined as the Writer's Villa, where this incident took place. But by the 1980s, Davis and her husband split and divorced. But at this time, Kathy's daughter was already grown, so she was off doing her own thing, college, whatever. Miss Kathy began a successful career as a landlord, using her spacious, empty villa as a temporary home for her well healed clients as were in between permanent housing. So if you were just moving to California and off seeking somewhere to live, you're having a house built, whatever it may be, Kathy's place was like a temporary and it had every, all the amenities for you. It was a bed and breakfast. The room was already set up so you didn't have to buy any furniture. So it was the ideal situation for in-between places. Davis, a lively woman with short gray hair and a sparkling wit who opened up her doors to these said in-betweeners. Uh, Miss Kathy would speak to her residents after an audition. If it didn't go as exactly well as they planned, Kathy would kind of talk them down and say, you know what? It's not meant to be, but you know, you did the best that you could. Better luck next time. And she really encouraged people. It just seemed like she had a really big heart. And then she was also known to cheer people up with her famous homemade tamales, which I found really interesting because I'm one that will try to cheer you up with food. Uh, Thomas Jane, the star of HBO's Hung, he moved into the villa after a breakup with a girlfriend in 2001. He just said he needed a quiet place to stay. He says that I met Kathy and fell in love with her place immediately. The dark wood, the heavy furniture relaxed him. It was the perfect place to lick my wounds. So if that gives you kind of an, an imagery of what this place was, it wasn't the party house. It was very tranquil. She had a beautiful grounds, a, a beautiful patio. So it was just a place in between, hang out with Miss Kathy, a clean, warm, warm bed. Through word of mouth, Davis's reputation in this upscale Hollywood community grew. When someone moved on, they would tell the next person about the villa. The rent was not cheap, okay? So now we're in 2009, 2012, and the rent is 1650 all the way up to 3000 And this would get you, that's all bills included, so the 1650 isn't tear, 3000 is a lot. So um, uh, you get one bedroom, a sitting area, a private bathroom, and then there was common areas, including the living room, a large stone patio, uh, landscape grounds, um, and then there was also a shared kitchen. Uh, the kitchen was frequently filled with ambitious, talented tenants, so it was a good place to hang out. It was kind of like the area where people would, you know, hey, how's it been, whatever. In the summer of 2009, Lewis learned that his girlfriend actress Diane Marshall Green was pregnant. On April 6, 2010, Marshall Green gave birth to a girl, Kuma May. At the time that Kuma was born, Johnny's daughter, they were not no longer dating. But the couple settled in an apartment in Hollywood to raise their daughter together. But the arrangement, however, just wasn't working out as they typically don't. And so he ended up moving out and then over the next 
period of time they were fighting over custody of the little girl, which ultimately Johnny lost. In October 2011, Lewis lost control of his Triumph motorcycle near 29 Palms, and when he checked into the hospital, they checked for signs of a concussion, but he was allowed to leave after tests came back negative. Michael Lewis, however, noticed that his son's behavior became erotic and bizarre. So Michael Lewis scheduled two MRIs for Johnny, which Johnny refused to undergo. Friends were noticing changes as well with Lewis's behavior. Lewis was said to have attended an acting class in December. He kept speaking in a vaguely British accent. I talked to him about it because I was confused, but he shrugged it off. You know, the friend just shrugged it off like, you know, he's just being weird today. You know, we all go through moods, but he, he found it to be odd, but you know, hindsight is always 2020. Lewis was arrested two times between 2011 and 2012. On the morning of January 3rd, 2012, Johnny was lounging in his, his Northridge condo he had bought for his parents, so it was his parents' condo. Lewis, in only his pajama bottoms and a t-shirt, announced he was going for a walk. As he walked past a neighboring unit, he thought he heard cries of distress, and then he broke into this house. But the place was empty. There was nobody in there. It was an unoccupied unit. Not long after, two men and, uh, had arrived on the scene and asked him to leave. Lewis went after them with an empty Perrier bottle. Very bougie. A fight ensued, spilling out onto the patio. Lewis bit one of the men on the arm while attempting to flee. He was overpowered and detained until the police arrived. Lewis claimed he was acting in self-defense. Police charged him with trespassing, burglary, and assault with a deadly weapon, and he was sent to Twin Towers Jail. Three days later, his behavior landed him in the psychiatric ward as a 5150, code for involuntary confinement. He remained there for 72 hours. Lewis's father bailed him out. His discouraged summary read, chief complaint, blunt head trauma and suicidal official expressed that he was very concerned for his well-being of not only the community but that of the defendant. That Lewis suffered from mental issues as well as a chemical dependency and that Lewis would continue to be a threat to any community he may reside in. Lewis was released and he again went to his parents' house in Northridge, was a psychological and a mental wreck. He had, um, he was said to have had two black eyes. The older sister is noticing that he is just not himself. He looks a wreck, he's acting a wreck, something's wrong. He acted like one too. He wouldn't let anyone touch him or even near him. He was very sensitive to light and began turning off all the lights in the house. And eventually it got so extreme that he was disenabling the fuse box. But he was very sensitive to light. The following weeks were just followed with a bunch of self-destructive activity, including slashing his wrist in a suicide attempt. Michael being the father and a network of family and friends kept a close eye on him, but the end of January, Lewis seemed to be more stable and his father decided to let him live on his own in Santa Monica. But then again, trouble started immediately. On February 10th, Lewis was arrested for cold cocking a man outside of a yogurt shop. He was released on a $20,000 bond. Days later, he walked fully clothed into the ocean of Santa Monica and then was hospitalized for hypothermia. He was going through some stuff. On February 18th, he was arrested again, this time for trying to break into a woman's apartment in Santa Monica. He said he thought it was a friend's place. Again, he was released on bail. As the legal trouble grew, Lewis's condition worsened. In May 2012, Tucker pulled up, his friend pulled up, in one of his many court appearances, you know, to pick him up for it, was unsettled by the change in his demeanor. It was another person completely, he says. He had a look I've only seen in disturbed veterans of war. 
his memory was scattered. He, he would go back and forth from a lucid conversation and incoherent conversation. So it just sounded like he was just really struggling. Clear warning signs. Um, it was said that doctors prescribed Lewis with the drugs. I'm going to put them on the screen. Zemprexa and Abilify, both of which are used to treat schizophrenia and bipolar disorder but he resisted on taking the medication. They were said that he was cheeking the pills, like hiding them in his mouth, pretending to swallow them, but then of course spitting them out. Um, part of the problem, according to his father, was that Lewis had yet to receive a clear diagnosis. Was he bipolar, psychotic, or as the father believes, suffering a traumatic brain injury. The father is really pushing the narrative with good reason of the traumatic brain injury. So he's saying we gotta take into account the motorcycle accident, that he had a head trauma. There's not a lot of information about this, this motorcycle accident. Um, he apparently went to the hospital, but there's no information. Was he wearing a helmet? He was released without a concussion, so I have questions. But then, okay, so we, we include the motorcycle accident, and then he was beaten in the Northridge break-in, uh, where he was hit on the head 17 times. And then while in jail, he was pounding his head against the concrete. And that's just the stuff that they knew about, according to Michael, Johnny's father. Head trauma can trigger behavioral changes, says Christopher Giza, a pediatric neurologist at the UCLA Brain Injury Research Center. Some areas of the brain are particularly prone to traumatic brain injury. If you have an injury in your frontal lobes, you can have significant changes in behavior irritability, impulse control, and at the extreme end of things, violent outburst. But Lewis was neither diagnosed with nor treated for severe head trauma, and the symptoms from his, what he father describes after the October 2011 motorcycle accidents with the headaches and the sensitivity to light are indicative of mild injury, such as a concussion, says Giza, which can trigger aggressive behavior. On May 23rd, 2012, after two months in lockup, okay, he's been locked up for two months. Now Lewis was transferred over to a place called Ridgeview Ranch in the foothills of Altadena. At this Ridgeview Ranch, they have activities that include equine therapy, yoga, meditation, art therapy. Ridgeview calls itself a dual diagnosis center, treating residents for psychosis and substance abuse. His family believed his stay there was better than being in jail, which I can't disagree. It sounds like a lot better than jail. Lewis expressed in an email that he sent to his friend Tucker and other friends, who, um, who later shared this letter with Michael Lewis, the father. On June 12th, uh, 2012, the core of the story, this is from Johnny, the core of the story is that I was involved in a fight, my actions were self-defense, but my means were a glass bottle. After a few court dates, a stint in county jail, and a realization that there is no self-defense law in California, I am back on my feet and doing well. The court case is still ongoing, but from what we're hearing, it is every good chance of getting dropped outright or disappearing with time served. At the end was a postscript that read, on a side note, we are pleading rehab to avoid trial. Addicted to marijuana, what a trip. So he knew it was a joke. He knew he wasn't addicted to marijuana. So he's he's at Ridgeview, um, and Lewis claims that he's addicted to marijuana. And so that didn't fly with trained counselors and fellow addicts, says Michael, the father. So he switched and pretended to be addicted to alcohol. Despite the questionable diagnosis, the treatment for the disease he didn't believe he had, Lewis's mental state began to improve. In one of the final journal entries from July 2012, Lewis wrote, felt more whole today, more complete. Like parts of myself have been stolen in my sleep and scattered all over the world, and now it's begun to return. I'm more determined than ever now. I face what I am. 
I face what I was. What I get from this is that he's in this ridge view, he's going through these therapy sessions, possibly taking his medication, and he's he's improving, he's getting better. And if there is any drugs, they're out of his system now. But we'll get to the drug part later. So despite his efforts to plead marijuana abuse and alcohol abuse, that just didn't fly. He ended up being transferred back to the Twin Towers, the jail. But because of the county's overcrowdedness of the jails, Lewis' sentence was dramatically reduced. He spent a total of six weeks in jail before being released on September 21st, five days prior to his fatal end of himself and Miss Kathy. So the very first night that he got out, he ended up checking himself into a Las Feliz hotel, which was in Atwater Village. The, the following Sunday, his father helped him shop for new clothes and driving him around to certain errands, and then he ended up picking up his Triumph motorcycle. Lewis asked his father to contact the writer's villa, Miss Kathy, to see if she had any space available it was said that Michael was trying to encourage him to go back to Ridgeview where he was improving. You know, after a couple months, he wrote that note that he's finding himself again. So his father is trying to talk him into going back there, but Johnny just was not having it at all. So Michael agreed uh, to contact the writer's villa. He believed that it was a quiet and peaceful place, which could be the best next thing for Johnny. It didn't occurred to Michael, this is what Michael had stated, is that it didn't occur to me. Oh, by the way, he's having problems, he says. I thought it was a place he was familiar with and they will give him a lot of love. So after this phone call between Michael and Miss Kathy, Miss Kathy ended up setting up the same room that Johnny had slept in before. She made sure it was ready for him. It was available. So deal was done. On Monday, uh, September 24th, 2012, uh, Lewis moved into his old room on the second floor of the villa. Michael called the following day, which would be the 25th, and just to check in on Johnny, and he answered the phone and very agitatedly I'm busy. What do you want? Johnny eventually calmed down and told his father that he would talk to him later. But unfortunately, this was the last time that Michael would ever speak to his son. September 26, 2012. This is the day of the incident. Police pulled up to the villa. They spotted Johnny Lewis in the middle of the driveway, lying face up and lifeless. Looking at the villa, they saw like a patio. It was an incline, I'll insert a picture, incline of a patio and a roof. So they assumed that he had either fallen, slipped, or intentionally fell off of this. So they could tell that, that it was a lifeless body. Um, he had several uh, traumas that were visible plus a uh, pooling of blood. So it was it was pretty gruesome. So as they walk into the villa is a more traumatic scene. So if you are sensitive to animals and whatnot, I would fast forward right now. Um, I'll put a, a time stamp in, but um, I'll get to that part um, in a little bit. But inside, it was even more gruesome than outside. They walk upstairs to the first floor, which the first floor was pristine. There was, it was very clean, very organized. But then when they got to the second floor, it was broken glass, broken furniture. And then they entered um, a large bedroom, which was on the southwest corner, which was Lewis's room. And there they found a bloody rusty hammer just lying on the floor with, you know, traces of blood. Uh, following the trail of destruction, they go into Lewis's attached bathroom where they find a cat who had been dismembered and, uh, and was dead. Across the hall from Lewis was the master suite, which Kathy Davis, Miss Kathy, slept in. That was her room. There was blood on her her bed frame, the wall, the chair that was in the room. 
On the floor next to the bed laid her body. It was not a pretty scene. There was evidence of blunt force trauma to her head, which fractured her entire skull, obliterated the left side of her face, leaving her brain exposed wrote the coroner's official medical examiner, Kelly Blanchard, in her report. Her face is covered in blood, which I, I gotta imagine that was just a gruesome scene. This part is just disturbing. There was four small puncture wounds on her cheek, presumably from a mechanical pencil that was found beside the body. The official report released two months later revealed that Davis had been killed by blunt force trauma to her head and had signs of manual strangulation. So investigators are trying to figure out what happened, how events happen. So this part, I'm just gonna go into investigators are trying to replay and this is what they have said. Uh, so investigators believe that just minutes after he had introduced himself to his neighbor, Blackburn. So he went over to his neighbors who was working out in the yard and he's like, hey, I'm your new neighbor, Johnny. And the neighbor was like, hey, hi, how are you? And then Johnny went back to the villa and Blackburn went back to, you know, doing whatever he was doing. And so when Johnny went back to the villa is where the incident took place with both Kathy and the cat. It's undetermined of what fueled this rage when he went back to the villa, but there was rumors that went around. This is allegedly, but one of Davis's friends said that the day before, Johnny Lewis had went to the fuse box and turned off all the electricity. And so this was the night before. And so if they're trying to create a scenario of what happened, they're saying that Davis probably approached Lewis, uh, Miss Kathy and Johnny. She probably went to him and said, hey, you know, you can't be doing that, whatever. This is what provoked it. It could have been nothing, it could have been that. But it's, if that did indeed happen, then I could see that. That's, that's, I mean, the results are unthinkable, of course, but I'm just saying it, it would light a fire under somebody who's already fuming. So he went back, he had maybe allegedly had this conversation with Kathy. That um, tragic event happened, but then Johnny left the house and went back over to Blackburn's house, the neighbor. He was not wearing a shirt. He only had his jeans on and he went back over there. He didn't approach Blackburn. He actually started hitting this house painter that was doing some work on Blackburn's house. He's just this innocent bystander doing some work on the house as a house painter. And Johnny started, you know, hitting him and whatnot. Blackburn's wife is in the house and she starts screaming when she sees this incident between Lewis and the house painter. And then Blackburn goes over. Blackburn's an older gentleman. How old was he? Do I have that age in here? I want to say that he was in his 60s, 70s. So he was an older gentleman. So he's trying to get Lewis off of this house painter. And Lewis, you know, of course, punches him. And there's this whole struggle. But then the house painter, and Blackburn were able to get away. They ran in the house with Blackburn's wife and Lewis was trying to like get into the house. Like they had to like barricade the door, get his arm out of the door because he was trying to get in there. When that was unsuccessful, uh, Blackburn's wife called the police and that's when the they heard screaming of a woman. So I don't know if that was from Kathy or Blackburn's wife. Either way, the police were on their way. And so Johnny jumped back over the fence back to the villa and Blackburn described it as like a Spider-Man climb. Like he had superhuman powers, like he was just super strong. Um, so he ascended back to the patio or the roof. They don't know which one. And then he either jumped, slipped off of the roof. Wasn't an accident, wasn't intentional, no, it is, it is unclear. His death was officially ruled as an accident and not a suicide. We know that he was suicidal in the past. Did he jump? Did he slip? It, we'll never know. And 
frankly, I don't know if we really need to know. As this is rolling out to the media, the theory quickly emerged on the internet that Lewis was doing bath salts. And this, bath salts are a, a legal designer drug often containing amphetamine-like chemicals called MDPV. The use of bath salts have made the headlines in the spring. Uh, the snortable and injectable powder is reportedly a catalyst for a handful of, of grizzly attacks around the country. Another theory is that he was on the designer drug Smiles, is what it's called. A psychedelic ingested as a pill powder or mixed with chocolate that has been linked to a series of suicides and overdoses. But in Lewis's toxology report, which came back two months after the incident, indicated that there was no drugs, alcohol in his system, no bath salts, no meth, or, or cocaine. And even his prescribed drugs that he was getting, those weren't in his system either. He wasn't taking the medication. What I find interesting is the drug Smiles is different from other drugs. Uh, it is it's in a different family than the drugs mentioned that he tested negative for. I found one report that said that smiles would not show up on a normal drug test. I don't know, because the the police, they were already on to him that he could be doing the smiles, I'm sure that they tested it, because they can test for anything if they know exactly what they're testing for. So I, I didn't see evidence that 100% he was tested for it because sometimes it's confused that bath salts and smiles are the same thing in which they're not. They're not the same thing. And so I wasn't able to find anything to rule out the drug smiles. And I just find it interesting that smiles was the drug that he was rumored to be on. You know, it's a designer drug. It's not a well-known. I mean, it is well-known, but I mean, at the time it was well-known. Me doing this is the first time I've ever heard of this drug, Smiles. So it just seems like it's not like a mainstream, but maybe it is. I don't know. He was rumored to be on this, this drug, Smiles. You know, not Coke, not crack, not meth. You know, not that kind of stuff. And so if he was rumored to be on it, I gotta imagine that they tested him for it. And then I have a report that says that he would show up negative for it anyways. So I don't know. I don't know. What do I know? So in Lewis's autopsy, um, of course, they ruled it as an accidental death. Um, he had a partial strangulation on himself, um, head trauma. Of course, he fell 15 feet and he had uh, scratches. So it could have been from Davis. It could have been from the house painter. It could have been from Blackburn. It, it, it's really hard to say. Uh, the toxology report was a disappointment. If it wasn't drugs, what drove Johnny to this horrendous murder? And he had never had a history of violence, not even close to this extreme, that I could find. Critics of Scientology uh, have pointed out that the church has a resistance to psychiatry, which could have been a possibility for Lewis's... Um, behavioral issues and his downturn, but Lewis's father discounts this assumption. He said that he had tried to seek out psychiatric treatment for his son, which his son just would not comply. He just refused to. I, I want to go back in time just a little bit. Okay, so we have Katy Perry, who broke up with them, who has said that, you know, they were going down different paths and she wanted to focus on her career. And then we have a note from Kurt Ruther, who was his boss on Sons of Anarchy, okay? He wrote in a tweet, I wish I could say that I was shocked by the events last night, but I am not. What happened? So Johnny Lewis was said to have left Sons of Anarchy after two seasons because he didn't like the character that he was portraying. He didn't like the amount of violence in the show total contradictory what happened later in life for him. So, but of course, as any estate that's left, there is no exceptions to family feuding in the Johnny Bah saga. So it was said that Diane Marshall Green and Michael were fighting over his estate. And then it sounds like Michael later was suing somebody, but According to court documents, um, Lewis was worth about 41000 when he died, and so 
it's not a huge amount of money. I mean, it's a lot of money, but it's not millions. So anyways, there was some feud going on there. But I have mixed feelings about this one. I just, a psychotic break, you hear it in true crime all the time. It is no surprise. I see it a lot in women who are struggling from postpartum. It's an awful, awful thing that these people or drugs that they're they're heavily on drugs. But anyways, it's heavily um, prominent on women who just never had any issues, who love that had been said to love their children, then all of a sudden they snap. So you see that often and it's just uncharacteristic. But then, you know, you see this case and you're, you know, wow. I feel so bad for both the Lewis family and the Davis family. It's such tragedy and it wasn't really predicted before a couple months. I mean, before these brain injuries and whatever he was going through. Should have Michael Lewis warned Davis of his aggressive behavior? Hindsight's always twenty twenty, And I think as a parent, we always try to find the best in our children. And never would Michael ever predict that he would you know, do what he ended up doing. There's just no way. And I think, like I said, he was trying to find the best in, in his son. And although he knew that Johnny was really struggling, what, what eventually happened, I think, was so far from his mind. And he probably didn't want to lose that opportunity to give him this tranquil, peaceful room to rent, you know, so he could recover and lick his wounds. But... I don't know, it's hard to say. Like I said, hindsight's always 2020. It's It's hard to say. Traumatic event that we should all learn from if you find that your family member is going down some kind of similar path, maybe not even this dramatic. Just, you know, try to help them as much as you can. You know, it sounds like Michael was trying to help, but I imagine that Michael uh, Lewis was also you know, he's bailing him out of jail all the time. He's probably really struggling himself. So I gave my opinion. You guys let me know what yours is down in the comments. I'd love to hear what you have to say about this case. You know, I'm, I haven't completely closed the door of drugs, but I think that's only because I'm, I just want to go there. But traumatic brain injury, of course, is definitely the frontal lobe, we see that a lot in serial killers, so it could be that. It could be that he had a mental break, just in general. Let me know your guys' thoughts down in the comments. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. Bye.